we've now come to the section where we're going to begin focusing on MySQL clients, beginning with the MySQL primary client called MySQL, conveniently. We've been using the client to connect in both interactive and batch modes to perform various operations such as selects and showing variables and status information. But what really happens under the hood and how flexible is the MySQL client and how much can we customize it? To answer those questions what we need to do is drill deeper to see how the client works, what files it relies upon and what options can be passed to it to make our usage of the MySQL client much more pleasurable. So having said all that, let's quit the existing shell. We will create a new section in our text file called MySQL clients beginning with the MySQL primary batch slash interactive client. This client is the primary interface, the primary shell interface that is, since most of MySQL's history is tied to the shell, you should become as proficient as possible in this client so you can be successful in navigating your way throughout MySQL instances in your corporate environment. So having said all of that, what exactly happens when you run MySQL? First and for foremost, let's find out where it is on the system. So we'll execute a which MySQL, and on a standard Linux system, you'll find that it's located in user bin, and it's called MySQL. Let's ensure that it's not a symbolic link by LSLing the path, and it isn't. So by virtue of installing MySQL, it creates a binary in user bin. Binaries that are located in user bin are accessible to all users on the system, as evidenced by the permissions that you see reflected in this long display using the ls command. All users can read the MySQL binary and they can also execute it, but only the root user can make changes to it if necessary, such as what would happen if you were to upgrade from the current version to a later version, or even downgrade. Super. Now an RPM query file of the same file located in user bin is no longer in our memory, so it's RPM query file user bin MySQL reveals that it belongs to the MySQL client standard package for the current version. Now when you run MySQL, it searches two places for configuration files or options files. Let's list that. So MySQL searches two places for options files. One is etc my.cnf. This is a global location for configuration items that can be read by any MySQL program, including the server itself. And two, it also searches the home directory, which within a Linux bash shell environment is revealed using the tilde variable or using the home variable. Either or works. Home forward slash dot my dot cnf. The leading dot means that the file is hidden. So MySQL first will search etc my dot cnf, and this is not a required file. Let's copy it into memory and attempt to find it. Let's lsl the path and you'll see it doesn't even exist so it is no or by no means required on the system however if it is there any MySQL program will parse it looking for directives for example in the case of the server the server will search for directives that matter to the server such as which IP address to bind to whether or not to skip networking which port to listen to how much memory to use, and the client will search for information such as how to set up the prompt, what default database to use, what port to connect to, whether or not to use encryption, and any other feature that you can define on the command line, such as skipping column headers, using compression, and so on, many of which we'll take a look at in this section. So first and foremost, the MySQL client looks in etcmy.conf, or, or looks for etc my.cnf if it doesn't find it, it then proceeds to search the currently logged in user's home directory for a file called .my.cnf indicating that it's hidden. Now we're currently logged in as the user Linux CBT and we need to confirm whether or not there is a .my.cnf. There isn't. There's a history file. The history file basically contains all the statements that you've run. 
we can take a brief look at it and you'll see that here are the statements that we've executed over time including the most recent statements so an lsl of dot mysql dot history reveals what we just revealed which is that it was recently updated literally four minutes ago with recent commands this is a history file it's readable only by root and the user who owns the file linux cbt I suggest for security or enhanced security that you remove the .mysql history file and we'll show you how to do that shortly. There is no .my.cnf file so whenever we run mysql it reads its options from the third location which is from the command line. So the third place that the mysql client searches is the command line. So let's look at that logic once more. When you launch the MySQL client, and this applies also for other MySQL utilities, it searches etc my.cnf. If it doesn't exist, it searches the user's home directory .my.cnf. And if this doesn't exist, it accepts options from the command line, which explains why command line options override the previous two, because the client will accept or take its orders or directives from the most recently defined version of the option. In other words, let's say in the my.cnf we instruct in the client section that MySQL clients should use compression. Then there is no home.my.cnf. However, on the command line we tell it not to use compression. Then the last setting will override the previously defined setting causing the MySQL client to not use compression. So that's a little bit about how it works. Now what we want to do is define a .my.cnf file which will set the settings up just for the user called Linux CBT whenever the user runs the MySQL client, regardless of who we connect to the server as, simply just for the shell. So these options files pertain to how MySQL client utilities operate from the shell. But we can connect to the server as any user we want, super user or simply as an anonymous user. In either case, the configuration files are processed in the same logical fashion. Simply use a text editor such as Pico or Nano or whatever is installed, VI, etc., and define a file called my.cnf. This is a personal file. Many Linux and Unix programs function just like MySQL's clients in that they search for hidden files beneath the user's home directory since all users are expected to have a home directory if they're permitted login access to the server. Now, the MySQL client looks for a certain section in the my.cnf file because of the fact that the clients process a global file first and then a file in the user's home directory. So that means, similar to Windows INI files, we need to define sections or groups within the global or in the personal my.cnf file and there are certain groups read by certain clients. To figure out which groups are read, simply run the client. So in this case, we'll run MySQL followed by the help option. And after we run help, you'll see, shortly enough, the files that MySQL will process right above where we can define variables. We'll show you that shortly. It should be somewhere near where the variables are defined. Here it is. So the default options are read in the following order, and each of the clients return this information. First global, then in the user's home directory. However, we need to ensure that we place the directives in the proper section or the proper group area of the file. So the following groups are read. If we define our variables in either the MySQL or the client sections of either of the configuration files, we can rest assured that the MySQL client will read the options from the appropriate section. So all we need to do is just define one of these sections. Let's go ahead and define a client section in the, in the Pico editor, that is. And the section header should be defined in between brackets, as you see here. This is a section header, and if we had one for MySQL, it would look just like the following, with statements immediately following. But we're only going to define headers for, or values beneath the header for client. So what is an option that we can turn on that we want to persist all the time, unless we override it from the command line? One option may be the ability to connect using compression. But before enabling compression, let's connect to MySQL. We'll do so as user root, since we have more privileges when we do. And we will use the show status command to see whether or not the default connection relies upon compression. So let's see. We'll specify the password as abc123. And then we'll connect and execute a show status. Let's see what happens. 
Now show status returns all sorts of variable information, but we'll scroll up and search for compression, which is in the section, of course, logically with all of the C's. Compression by default is turned off. Compression may be ideal if you're connecting across a wide area network connection, such as the internet, using a VPN, SSH, Telnet, or whatever protocol you happen to use. So you may effectively increase the performance of the client to server connection by turning on or enabling compression. So this is one candidate option that we can turn on in the my.cnf file, the hidden file, or in the global section. Depends on how you want the system to operate. So how do we specify this compression option? Well, first and foremost, you need to run from the command line MySQL with its help option to see how to enable a given directive. For example, here's a variable section. In order to define a variable on the command line, you simply specify two leading dashes followed by the variable name, an equal sign, and its value. But in order to specify these same variables in one of the configuration files, we exclude the leading dashes and simply include the variable name equal value. So for example, all we'd need is compress equals false and would be good to go. So let's get compress return to the config file paste compress equals false and that's all that's necessary or true in this case and that's all that's necessary to enable compression when connecting so to recap any variable that you can define on the command line using leading dashes can be defined in the configuration file by excluding the leading dashes and simply specifying the variable name equals value and we should have that value turned on, at least on a per user basis, whenever Linux CBT, the user, is attempting to connect to the DBMS as any user. If you want these settings to persist for all users on this local host, then specify these directives in the global etc my.conf file. But let's proceed with this particular option to see if it actually works. So, we'll save it. We don't need to exit the shell, but what we will do in a separate window is quit the existing session, which we have, we're no longer in, and then we'll connect, we'll connect as the user root, which isn't necessary, but we'll do so because it's simpler, and we won't be restricted. Once connected, we'll then rerun the show status, and then we will check the value of the compress which we we'll, which is currently set to on so although we're connected to the local system our connections will go faster because compression is turned on albeit it requires a little more CPU overhead on the part of the client and the server to compress the communication stream between the two but nonetheless it is turned on and what it proves is that the options file was read but what happens if you attempt to connect to the server as a different user who does not have this value defined? Well, of course, obviously compression won't be turned on. So in a separate shell, let's SU in, and after we've SU'd in, you'll see that our new home directory, if we echo dollar sign home, which is a Linux variable, is now root. Let's go to our home directory and ensure that we don't have any MySQL configuration files. Then as root, let's attempt to connect to the local instance as the user root with a password of abc123 and then we'll see whether or not compression is turned on using the show status show command we'll scroll up and search for compression and what you'll see shortly enough is that compression is turned off which proves that on a per user basis the client will read the file and apply it only on a per user basis but if we want the settings to persist globally then we need an etcmy.cnf so in order to make this possible on a global scale, simply create a file in etc, and we will, as root, since root has the proper privilege to write the file to etc, use pico to modif to create a new file that is called my.cnf, and then modify it by placing the client section and compress equals true. Then, once it's saved, we'll confirm that all users are able to read the etc my.cnf file, but the default umask permits reading by all users. Nonetheless, let's take a look. lsltr etc my.cnf. You'll see that all users can read it. We don't need for all users to modify or execute the file, just simply to be able to read it when the MySQL or similar clients run. Now, as the user root, let's rerun that MySQL connection to connect and once we've connected, we will rerun show status and then find the compress section. You'll see that compression's turned on. On a per user basis, we can get rid of entirely 
the my.cnf file and then create a, an entirely new connection to the server and after we've created that new connection we just need to find our history here you'll see that compression is still turned on let's run show status and search for the compression option and you'll see shortly enough because of the global file that compression is turned on so settings that you want to apply globally place them in etc my.cnf and per user settings should be placed in home or in the users home directory dot my dot cnf and optionally you can override settings that have been previously defined on the command line now this is by no means a comprehensive look at how the entire MySQL client operates, but next we look at some more key things you can do with the MySQL client. So we've looked at setting up a global as well as per user configuration files and now we want to just show you some other neat things you may want to apply globally. Let's say for example you want to force the way the prompt looks. MySQL supports many many variables which define what's presented in the prompt. Well, to recap, let's connect to MySQL, which we do have a connection here. You notice that the default prompt is pretty vanilla. It doesn't say much. It just says MySQL and the greater than sign or the output redirection symbol. That isn't very descriptive. MySQL maintains many running variables, and many of them can be outputted in the prompt, which provides more useful information to the currently connected user. When you have a normal Linux shell like we do here in our third window after we've quit this session, you'll see that when you're logged into the host, at least the host names return and the current directory. So here it is, and if we were to exit, you'll see that logged in as a non-privileged user, the username is re revealed by the bash shell, followed by the host name, followed by the current directory. So if we had a directory called temp, and we do, and we navigate it into it, the very end of the prompt is updated to show that we are now in home slash temp. This is useful because it tells us where we are and it helps us to navigate. We can do similarly in MySQL. In other words, MySQL is modeled after the way Bash and other shells present prompt information, useful prompt information. The simple decision that needs to be made is whether or not to force the prompt, a consistent prompt for all users, which means a global setting, etc my.cnf, or on a per user basis. The former, which is the global setting, is much, much easier to maintain than per user settings. For example, let's say you have 300 users on your system. Each user would have to maintain their prompts, or one administrator would have to maintain prompts. So it would be just much easier to just force a consistent look of the prompt across the board unless individual users would like to tailor their own settings but because the global file is read first then the per user file users could override what you specified globally anyway so having said all that let's modify the global file to show a consistent prompt now the prompt needs to be beneath a mysql section so as root which we will need a root shell in order to update let's quit this particular session here and find a root shell. Let's see if we have one in one of these windows and we don't. So we'll SU in right here and as root once we're in we'll use pico to modify etc my.cnf and there's currently a client section but the prompt is read from a mysql section so we'll define a section called mysql and beneath it we'll define the prompt. Now you don't need to memorize the variables for the prompt they're in the mysql reference documentation but we'll show you the syntax that you can use for a nice prompt that will show you at least the username at the host followed by the current database that you're currently logged into. That's very useful. In order to do so you simply define prompt equal followed by your series of variables and we'll include the user and host in between parentheses so we'll double backslashes to escape the backslash and in other words MySQL processes variables such as backslash u which really means user but because of interpolation rules you need to specify double backslashes to preserve one backslash so that by the time MySQL reads after the shell has done its stripping the backslash is still preserved. This is why we use two backslashes to preserve one backslash. So backslash backslash u really ends up becoming backslash u by the time MySQL processes the prompt directive. Remember this file etc my.cnf is really sitting on a Linux file system and has to be interpreted initially by the shell and then by the MySQL terminal monitor. So backslash backslash u at 
at is a common way of specifying the destination or the host. So username at, mimicking again the bash shell, backslash backslash h logically is for the host, and then we close paren. But then let's also in between brackets, similar to what's documented in the reference manual, include information for the current database in between brackets. And then we'll terminate the prompt using an output redirection symbol or greater than sign, followed by backslash backslash underscore, which gives us a little space. This is a very simple prompt. You can include all sorts of information related to time, database information, current user, and so on. But then your prompt becomes pretty long. So usually you just want a simple prompt which tells you who you are and what database you're currently logged in into. Let's save this file. And then from the first window, we'll create a new session to the database. And you'll notice that the prompt is updated to reveal the username at the host. So this tells you who you're logged in as, and this saves us from having to constantly run select current underscore user or select user, either or. They're synonymous and interchangeable. This tells us that we're root at localhost with some space, and that we're currently logged into no default database which leads us to another thing. If you wanted to select a default database when entering the MySQL terminal monitor, from the shell, after you've executed all of your commands, the very first argument that MySQL interprets as the database name is where you specify the database name. So in this case, we'd simply say, use tempdb, for example. So after MySQL has processed all of its options, then you can specify the database that you'd like to default to. This will take us in directly to tempdb. And now it shows tempdb in the placeholder where we specify the slash d or backslash backslash d variable interpolated as backslash d, which renders the database that you're currently logged into. So now we're in tempdb. However, the default, as you know, let's quit, is to log in without a default database, which shows none. And the minute we use a database such as MySQL, it changes so that we know exactly where we are and the shell mimics a bash shell which is the beauty of it all super so we've set the prompt and if you wanted to set a default database you certainly could such as tempdb this could be specified on a per user basis or on a global basis it's probably recommended that you specify default databases on a per user basis because in all likelihood users are going to have different access to different databases but if you wanted to force a database you could this is one of the neat things of Linux based systems let's show you how you do that from a shell we modify pico etc my.cnf and under the client section simply include database equal let's say tempdb should be the default how do we know that the variable name is database you don't need to memorize this stuff simply execute mysql followed by help and you'll see that in order to set a database you simply specify database and its name that's all you need to do so for example and the reason why tempdb shows up here by the way is because by virtue of running mysql help which is what we just did the mysql client program has processed etc my.cnf. So this means that every time we log in, it'll be tempdb. But again, you remember the rules are as follows. If you specify a, a variable on the command line, you use the trailing or the leading, that is, dash dash, followed by the variable name equal to its value. If you specify the same variable in one of the config files, you simply specify the name of the variable equal the, its value without the leading dashes. So now, if we attempt to log into the database, we'll use MySQL, user root. But again, this doesn't apply only to root. It applies to any user using the MySQL utility. And we'll have it prompt us for the password this time so that any shoulder surfers will be unable to decipher what we're typing in, unless, of course, they can read the keyboard quick enough. Here it is. We're now, we now have a tempdb as a default database. And by simply modifying the file once more, we can change that on the fly. So let's backslash q to get out. We'll pico etc my.cnf and change the default database. And by the way, you can include comments here. So now we can have a new line and change it by just uncommenting the one that we're interested in publishing. So let's make MySQL the default database. But not all users have access to MySQL. So for non-privileged users, you want to be careful. Let's log in. And in fact, let's just run MySQL help. And you'll see that the default database is now MySQL. 
but nonetheless let's log in and see that it takes us directly to that database. It'll prompt us for the password to avoid shoulder surface from a security perspective and once we're in you can see that the root is logged in at localhost followed by a default database of MySQL. So a show tables will reveal tables that are related directly to the MySQL database. And if we want to use a different database, well, if you don't need to mem memorize the name, just execute show databases and then use the database that you're interested in, such as tempdb. And now we've switched context from the MySQL context to the tempdb context. If we quit and return, we're back to MySQL. Let's specify the password to help out the shoulder surfer. Now we're back into the MySQL database. There are many other directives that can be defined. Again, for the client that you're interested in forcing default, simply run the client with the help option and focus primarily on the variables section. Many of the variables that you see here also exist as options that can be specified on the command line. But for items that you want to set in config files, really focus on the variables section. These are the items that you want to dump into your per user or global configuration file. Super. Now what about that history file? We're logged in as root, and if we navigate into root's home directory, you'll see that there is a file called mysql .his underscore history that is. This is possibly a very dangerous file because users who gain somehow access to the root user's home directory can potentially leak information from your DBMS server by just examining the commands that you've run. They're generally SQL files. You won't find output or record related information in this history file but maybe you don't want to disclose commands you've executed against the server just to increase the security so a simple tactic recommended by the folks at MySQL and by other folks on the net is to simply link the MySQL history file to dev null dev null is a place or a black hole which is one of the storage engine types supported if you recall let's execute a MySQL just to recap that, so a MySQL user root and the password is abc123, but we'll send a command using the E option of show engines, and we could even grep the output when it's all said and done using the bash shell. So we could grep, for example, black hole, and you'll see that it's a storage engine. There it is. The black hole storage engine is really a link, a symbolic link to dev null, which means send it to nowhere, send it out into the sky if you will. Well, similarly, we can use dev null for many other uses such as linking the history file. So if you don't want the history file to be populated with items, simply create a symbolic link on a per user basis to dev null. In order to do so, you ln s symbolic link, specify the source first, which is dev null, followed by the destination, which happens to be our user's home directory followed by the dot mysql underscore history file. The file exists, so let's take a look at that file once it exists. That's the mysql history, there it is. Let's cat the contents of mysql history, and notice it has it contains items. So let's remove rf mysql history, it's, no, it's not a symbolic link, and then try to link it again. Now we have a new file. When we lsltra, you'll see that it's really now a pointer. This is exactly how it should look on your system, as a pointer to dev null. So if the file does exist, the symbolic link command will not overwrite the existing file. But if it doesn't exist, then it creates a symbolic link to dev null, which is a black hole. Now let's prove that the history items are no longer stored. We'll connect, and again, this is on a per user basis, which applies only to the root user. We'll connect as user root We'll prompt for a password, and of course we'll default to the database once we get in. And then we'll execute some commands such as show tables, show status, let's select user host password from user. Here are the users who are currently defined, including two roots, one like CBT, and so on. We can execute a show grants, which will show our current permissions, which shows that we have all privileges plus the grant option. And thus far, we've executed quite a few commands. Now, although we've linked the .mysql underscore history file to dev null, once you are in the terminal monitor environment, it maintains a history of commands that have been executed. But once we leave and re-enter, you'll see that none of these commands have been preserved.
That's important to know. Now you may be wondering, what if we were to launch a separate instance while still logged into this particular session? Well, we'll show you. In a separate window, we need to, of course, be logged in as the user root. So we'll su in, change into our home directory where dev null still is linked to MySQL history. Let's launch MySQL user root, be prompted for a password, and once in, let's go through the history. Currently I'm going up and down with the arrow keys and it's not working as expected. So as a result, it does work. Now, in the second window where we are logged in, where the history does work because it's all in memory, let's quit, re-enter, we'll specify the password on the command line, and you'll see that in this case the history is there. Now, which particular file is being read, let's quit and show you that. We'll quit and you'll see that the file is being read is actually the file that is unlinked. Once the file has been linked, it will not show up exactly as, ex as uh, intended. Super. So we have exactly what we want. Notice that this MySQL history file is not linked, which explains exactly why it is maintaining a history. So the symbolic link is not being referenced, but if it is being referenced, then rest assured that the items will not appear. So let's LSLTRA the MySQL history again. Notice it's unlinked. We'll cat it. It contains zero bytes currently. And from the separate shell, let's ensure that we have no sessions open. And let's LSLTRA again, and it's a blank file. Super. So that's a little bit about using MySQL with these options files. Next, we're going to move on to the other options that are supported using MySQL as a client.